Hello everyone. My name is Shubhajit Cho, and welcome to this session on risk assessment for NDFCs. In this session, we specially look at the risk at risk assessment cases where a large degree of subjectivity is involved. However, before we delve into the risk assessment methodologies, we first have to answer the question as to why risk assessment for NDFCs is necessary in the first place. And in order to answer this question, we have to look at the recent developments that have occurred in the NDFC sector. In recent years, the NBFC sector has grown substantially. It, is, it has so much so that the balance sheet of certain NBFCs, especially those in the upper layer, has ex exceeded the balance sheet sizes of some newly founded commercial banks. With the advent of FinTech, and the use of technologies by the NBFCs, the interconnectedness of NBFCs with other financial sector entities has also increased. A result of these factors is that the systemic risk posed by NBFCs to the financial sector in general has increased. In response, to such risk posed by the NBFCs, the RBI has come out with a number of regulatory prescriptions. First and foremost, the RBI have moved the NBFCs to a scale-based regulatory framework. Under this framework, the RBI has mandated a number of changes, uh, including uh, application of the process of internal capital adequacy, compliance risk assessment, and also the need for risk-based internal audit. ICAP, the mandate of ICAP is applicable to NDFCs in the middle and upper layer for compliance risk assessment also it applies to NDFCs in the middle and upper layer, while RBIA, the risk-based internal audit, is applicable for deposit-taking NDFCs and for non-deposit-taking NDFCs with an asset size of over rupees 5,000 pools. Hence, we see that for specified NDFCs, it has become necessary to put in a risk management framework and as part of the risk management framework to carry out risk assessments periodically. Now, in terms of risk assessment, we can classify risk into two parts. The first part refers to risks, which can be quantitatively assessed. So they are stochastic models readily available, which can be used to assess and quantify this sort of risk. These risks usually include risks like credit risk, liquidity risk, interest rate risk, market risk, etc. On the other hand, there are certain risks for which a quantitative approach is not possible. And the NBFCs will need to apply a subjective method. This these sort of risks are risks that need to that need to be assessed using qualitative models. What are the kinds of risks? I'm what are the kinds of risks that I'm referring to? So these are risks like compliance risks, reputational risk, strategic risk, and such. In this session, we are focusing on the on this later on this latter sort of risks for which stochastic models are not readily available off the shelf. In the risk assessment methodology that we recommend 
is a scorecard based qualitative methodology that uses a number of parameters to assess and quantify risk. So the first parameter that it considers is the inherent risk level. Inherent risk is the risk that is inherent to the NBFC's business model. And this risk is assessed without taking into consideration any risk mitigation or internal control processes that the NBFC may have put in. Also, this risk is assessed against risk events. Risk events are those events whose occurrence causes the materialization of the risk. So for example, a risk event may be a breach of conduct. Another uh, risk event may be a breach of data security. Inherent risk le levels should be assessed based on their based on the likelihood and consequence of the risk event in question. We have provided a guide which is available with this video in which we provide certain conditions and criteria which can be used to gauge the likelihood and consequence. After the inherent risk levels are calculated, one must look at the control activities that the NBFC has put into place. Control activities are those risk management or mitigation processes that the NDFC has put in to contain the risk event. Again, control activities or, or the effectiveness of control can be assessed by, by looking at the design effectiveness of the control and the implementation effectiveness of such control. Again, the PDF contains conditions and criteria on how to do this. Once both the inherent risk level and the control effectiveness levels are identified, the, con the control effectiveness is applied to the inherent risk level to, to arrive at the residual risk. So basically, the residual risk is the risk that is retained by the NBFC, that is, the part of the inherent risk that is not covered by the internal control. Now, we recommend that calculation of these residual risks take place across lines of business and risk sources. And once this assessment is done, the presentation to the board and the NDFC senior management take place at an aggregate level of the lines of business and risk sources. Uh, this is to ensure that folks uh, who are involved in senior management or the directors in the board do not lose sight of the forest for the trees. Just to clarify, when we talk about lines of business and support functions, we mean the various product lines and the product lines, the departments, and the support departments that the company has. For example, business lines may be lab, LAS, or legal based loans, while support functions may be IT or HR department. And looking at risk sources, what are risk sources? Resources are the elements which alone in or in combination has the potential to cause the risk event. So resources may be business practices, management related, employee related, or organization related. So now that we covered a little bit of theory, we can have a look as to how this works in practice. So just give me a moment uh, to, uh, to share an Excel-based model that we have prepared. So 
in the Excel sheet that is currently presented, you will see that an impact assessment is done. So the impact assessment is done by judging whether certain consequences can occur as a result of the risk. So you can see in the model, if I toggle any of the if I toggle any of the high severity consequences, for example, let's say large regulatory sanctions or loss of authorization to operate from N to Y, the impact score is changed to high. Whereas if certain low severity consequences are considered, for example, minor fines, if we toggle it to Y, the impact level may continue to be low. Similarly, there may be certain medium level risks that also can be toggled, which would similarly have an effect on the impact score. Now, once we have assess the impact, we assess the likelihood of the risk. Again, the likelihood may be high, medium, or low. And based on the combination of impact and likelihood, the inherent risk level is asserted. So for example, if impact is medium and I toggle the likelihood level to medium, the inherent risk continues to be medium. However, if I change likelihood to high, and also have the impact level set to high, you can see the inherent risk score has changed. Now, once the impact and inherent risk scores are Ascertain, we assert we ascertain the control effectiveness. Again, control effectiveness is, is assessed on the basis of design and implementation effectiveness. And again, if we toggle these levels, like for example, if I set the design effectiveness to weak, uh, okay, now there is a slight issue here. This should actually say weak control effectiveness also becomes weak. Uh, let me just adjust the formula if you give me a moment. Sorry, coming back to the model as we see. If the control effectiveness changes, for example, if the control effectiveness is low, since here the inherent risk is already low, the risk continues to be low. However, if the inherent risk was medium, a weak, with a weak control effectiveness, the residual risk level would have increased to medium. Now let's say or high severity consequence is possible as a result of the risk. So if I toggle, let's say one of these high security, high severity events to Y, and my inherent risk level is high with the weak control effectiveness, my residual risk level again goes up to the highest level. However, even if my inherent risk is high, but my control effectiveness is also strong, the residual risk remaining with, with the NDFC would be low. So this is how we do an assessment for a specific 
risk event in across uh, sorry across the line of investment and support functions of the NDSC. Once that is performed, and uh, you can see an illustration in this sheet. This model automatically arrives at a weighted composite risk score. So this composite risk score is the score, risk score for the different lines of business and the support functions. Like for it's in this case, the vehicle loan has a risk score of 8.62, the IT department has a risk score of 14. And also we can do a aggregation across risk sources. So for example, here we can see that the risk posed by organization related risk is 1.5, whereas the risk posed by management related activities is as high as 6.2. Please note uh, that the absolute value uh, of these risk scores are not relevant. What is relevant is the ranking of is the ranking of the score. So if we go to the next uh, sheet, you can see that a percentile is ranking that may be performed. A percentile this ranking can be performed by the NDFC to rank their lines of business and support functions on the basis of the risk score. And on the basis of such ranking, the company can also prepare. Uh, our risk radar, as you see in this sheet. Similarly, risk posts can be can be ranked for the risk sources, and a risk radar can be prepared. Once the company performs such an assessment over a number of years, they can also see a time series. A time series is helpful as the company can see the areas where the risk scores have changed substantially, and also they get an idea of where the scores or where the risk levels are getting. Uh, um, as a climax to this um, session, we share with you a sample format of a, of a compliance risk assessment report. In this sample format, we recommend that the assessment team share with the board and the senior management, the risk radar, as well as the risk ranking with the necessary commentary and the time series of the risk groups. A more granular presentation of the risks may not be very helpful for for the uh, for the board of directors or the senior management, however, the assessment team should apply their discretion to the level of detail that they put in this report. Um, that is all I have for today's sessions. Uh, in this session, we have covered why NDSCs need to put in place a risk assessment process, which NDSCs need to put in such processes. And we have also recommended a methodology for performing qualitative risk assessments. And I have also demoed the methodology using the Excel sheet. And at the end, provided you with a format of the risk report. I hope this session has been useful. Thank you.